program. So today we're going to be talking about biosecurity. And I know we've been talking about biosecurity for a long time, but it's a really important concept that we want to stress. And we really want to stress it even more now. The reason that we're stressing it is because if we have anybody here that has been a 4-H or for the last five, maybe seven years, back in 2015, we had an outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza, and that caused lots of problems because Ohio's industry that is number one is its agriculture industry and um, eggs and poultry are a huge part of that. We want to make sure that we are doing our very best job to avoid any problems similar to what we had back in 2015, where we had a large outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza, not only throughout our state, but throughout the Midwest. And what that meant for 4-H projects is you were not able to bring livestock projects to the fair, you actually had to bring posters. Right now, we do have an outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza in the majority of the eastern half of the United States and lots of different states. We have had a positive case in Ohio, but that doesn't mean that we cannot continue to practice our best biosecurity to maximize our chances of having a successful fair season. So back in 2015, it was a very large outbreak and it affected 50 million chickens and turkeys in the United States because this is a severe disease. We have had other outbreaks between then and now. That's one thing I want to stress. This is something that we monitor for very carefully, and we're constantly checking to see if we can find any evidence of avian influenza in migratory waterfowl, because we know that they can move through Ohio. Back in 2017 and in 2020, we had positive cases. But because we had great biosecurity in place, we avoided the huge problems in Ohio that we had back in 2015. So we did have our first positive case in either uh, in a backyard flock in Ohio. And that happened right in my county, about 15 minutes away from my house in Franklin County that was released on Monday. So we do know that we have it in a backyard flock in Ohio and that flock um, was depopulated to make sure that it didn't have a chance of spread. Un good thing about that location is it's not near any of our commercial poultry operations, so we don't have to do any further work that way. It is being maintained as a quarantine area, and we're going to continue to watch very carefully on that. We knew that we had highly pathogenic avian influence in Ohio because it unfortunately had affected some birds um, that were wild birds, because wild birds can be affected as well as be the reservoir for this disease. So when we talk about biosecurity, what we're talking about is prioritizing and protecting the health of your backyard flock. Even if your flock is one bird, one livestock project, we want to make sure that we are doing our absolute very best to prevent any disease getting into your birds. And you are the primary person that is going to be able to affect that. And what we're going to do is talk about the ways that you can make a positive impact on keeping your flock healthy by addressing the two types of biosecurity that can bring disease to birds. The first one is direct. A bird can transmit disease to another bird. That is something that we're watching for in high path avian influenza on multiple fronts. One, we're worried about migratory waterfowl like geese spreading disease into our backyard flocks, but we're also worried that potentially there could be some spread within a flock if a bird was to be infected. And then very, very importantly, I want to focus on indirect biosecurity. And what indirect biosecurity is, is when something else spreads disease to your birds. And I hate to say that the majority of the time, that's the people. So we want to talk about the ways that we can protect your birds so that disease does not get into your flock. Okay. So when we talk about basics of biosecurity, we're going to talk about bird to bird first, direct biosecurity. That can be wild birds. And we have concerns right now with migratory waterfowl because we did originally have positive cases and highly pathogenic avian influenza down in the Carolinas. And those birds were starting their migration from south to north. But 
Even when we don't have highly pathogenic avian influenza to worry about as a current outbreak, believe it or not, there are some diseases that wild birds, such as songbirds, can spread to your backyard flock as well. So we need to make sure that we address any of those concerns. We need to make sure that your birds cannot come in contact with wild birds because there is a risk of disease transmission if that would happen. We need to make sure that you have things like fencing around your coop and your run. Ideally, you would have bird netting around your coop and your run. Birds would like to get into your coop and run because you have things in there that they like. You have bird food, you have water, you have shelter, and you have security. But you don't want to have disease potentially spread into there. So it is a good idea to never let your birds interact with wild birds. In fact, what they're saying right now, and the recommendation is, is if you have the ability to house your birds indoors, you want to keep your chickens and your turkeys indoors for now, because the worry about highly pathogenic avian influenza is that great. So keep that in mind. Right now, we're stressing no interactions with any wild birds whatsoever. And if you have the ability to keep them indoors, you want to do that. Okay, so when I talk about highly pathogenic influ avian influenza, I want to kind of talk about where that comes from, how it gets from the wild into your birds. And so there's a, such a thing as a low pathogenic avian influenza. That is one that makes birds a little bit sick, but it's not the worry that high path leads high path would be. And that can circulate in migratory waterfowl and shorebirds out there in the wild. And then what happens is it can become infective. It can mutate into a highly pathogenic strain where it still is not showing big symptoms in waterfowl or shorebirds. But when it gets into backyard flocks or commercial flocks, then you can have outbreaks of disease because those birds are much more susceptible. The worry that we have when we first saw that the birds in the Carolinas were carrying high path avian influenza is we knew that they were coming our way eventually. When those birds were first diagnosed, that was back in January and in February, and they were just getting ready to start their migration. So birds fly all over the world. They migrate from north to south and south to north, depending on the season. And when they migrate to various places, they can interact with other birds. And when they interact with other birds, that's a chance for bird to bird transmission of disease. Then when they start their migration and they start moving to other places, they can bring that disease with them. And Ohio is one of the states that is crossed by, believe it or not, two different migratory pathways. You have the Mississippi America's Flyway, and you can see it comes right up the Mississippi River. And there's a branch of it that goes over northwestern Ohio in the Western Lake Erie Basin. And then you have the Atlantic Flyway, where you have a pathway that crisscrosses over the Mississippi Americas. And so you have two flyways that actually impact Ohio in the same place in that same Lake Erie Basin. But you can see that birds basically migrate over the entirety of Ohio because birds love Ohio. We have stuff that they like. We have water that they like. We have Lake Erie to the north and we have the Ohio River to the south. And then we have a lot of land in between that we have in agronomic crops like corn and beans. And so birds really do like Ohio. And right now we are in the migration period of birds that are moving from the south to the north by both the Atlantic flyways and the Mississippi flyways. And so we have lots of birds entering into Ohio. So right now is when we have to be on high alert to make sure that we are practicing our absolute very best biosecurity so that we can prevent disease from entering into our flocks. Okay. Now, this is something that's going on all over the eastern half of the United States because these birds fly all over the place. And so when we look at these flyways right here, we can see that we have birds that are flying to just about every state in the United States. And when we look at this new web page that the USDA just came out with, it shows what birds are affected by state. And right now, the only birds that we've got positive in Ohio in backyard or commercial was a backyard flock, one flock that had 20 birds in it, and that was in Franklin County, right here where Columbus is. And there's a number of different states, as you can see, that have been affected. When we first had cases, they were down here, and then the birds started migrating up north. 
one of the places where we're seeing the largest number of birds affected is in Iowa. So at the height of the last avian influenza um, in, in infectious episode that we had in 2015, there were 50 million birds affected. Right now, we have roughly 22 million birds affected, so we are pretty severe into this, um, but the majority of them are in Iowa. Probably 18 to 20 million of the birds that have been affected are in Iowa, and the problem with that is, is Iowa is our number one state, I believe, for the production of eggs for table egg use, which is um, affecting how many eggs are available in stores right now, right before Easter. It can be tough to find eggs in stores right now. So let's talk for a minute about the National Poultry Improvement Plan. This is something that's very important when we consider how we can practice biosecurity to make sure that we are not bringing disease into our flock and we're practicing um, the ways that we can keep our flock as healthy as we can. The National Poultry Improvement Plan was established in the 1930s to originally eradicate pylorum disease, which is that disease that we test for before fairs. That is um, a, a pretty devastating disease, and we test for that to make sure that we don't have any outbreaks of that as well, and that's great biosecurity. The NPIP, National Poultry Improvement Plan, also targets a couple of other salmonellas and mycoplasmas, and it also targets preventing highly pathogenic avian influenza. What I recommend that as we are going into chick season right now and you're getting your birds, whether that's for personal use for your family or that is for a livestock project, if you um, are getting birds for a livestock project, try to purchase your birds from an NPIP approved hatchery or wherever you get them sources them from an NPIP approved hatchery so that you know that you are getting birds that come to you as healthy as they can. So when we talk about the basics of biosecurity, direct biosecurity, there's a couple other things that I want to address. And that is when we have bird to bird where we're talking chickens potentially spreading disease to chickens or turkeys to turkeys. So besides addressing interactions with wild birds, making sure that you don't have any wild bird interactions with your birds, make sure that you are sourcing your birds from the healthiest place you can, especially right now, because we definitely need to practice our best biosecurity. So it can be tempting to get birds from any number of different places, such as Craigslist or humane organizations or rehoming them. Just make sure that if you do that, you are practicing good quarantine, you're working with your veterinarian to make sure that you're not bringing a problem in because there's a number of different diseases that can actually be present in birds and not show any signs. That's called an asymptomatic carrier. And when you bring a bird in that might carry disease and it might not be showing clinical signs, but then you mix it with other birds, that's very stressful for them. And that stress can lead to an outbreak of disease. And then you might have some shedding into your flock and we don't want that. And so make sure that you are sourcing your birds from as healthy a place as you can get them. And you're making sure to practice good biosecurity when you do that, observing quarantines um, and making sure that you're working with your veterinarian if you have any questions about whether birds are coming in that might have any disease. Okay, so this is what I have going on at my work right now. I work on Waterman Farm and I have migratory waterfowl all over the place. And this is something that we have concerns with because if your birds are outside and they're allowed to go out and interact, maybe go to the farm pond, they're going to come in contact with the migratory waterfowl. But I wanna make sure that we understand that it can be any number of different potential transmissions. And so one of the things I wanna point out is highly pathogenic avian influenza can actually be shed in the feces of migratory waterfowl. I have birds all over the place at my work right now. They're out in the lawn here. They're walking around the garden. They're walking around the parking lot. I had a conversation with a colleague of mine and she has backyard poultry and she wasn't really worried about highly pathogenic avian influenza because she wasn't thinking that she was gonna have any ducks or geese fly into her small backyard. But I wanted to point out to her that she could simply walk through some piles of goose poop that are out at the parking lot as she's going into her car, and then she could bring that home to her birds. And so we wanna make sure that we are not having direct, direct biosecurity problems where we can get birds from places where we don't know potentially what their prior health was, but we also wanna talk about 
indirect biosecurity. And indirect biosecurity is where something else transmits disease into your flock. And I'm showing a picture of the fair there because fair is coming up and I am hoping and hoping and hoping that we have a successful fair season and we don't have any complications. But there is a lot that 4-Hers can do practicing biosecurity to make sure that the fair is the safest place it can be. Because if you think of what the fair is, the fair is where everybody brings their animals to one central location and then walks around that location for a week or maybe even 10 days. And then they go home during the day or they take their animals home at the end of the fair. And at the fair, in, with that many animals and people in an interactive space, there can be the potential for some contamination with disease. Make sure that you are practicing good biosecurity when you move between the fair and back to your house where your other animals are or your barn is um, or your other livestock projects would be. And what I mean by that is make sure that you understand that when you interact with other animals, animals that could be going to the fair that could be going to your friend's house to check out their backyard poultry or their other livestock projects that if there's any disease where you were you want to make sure that you're doing your best job to not bring it back to your animals and i know you have lots to do when you're at the fair you wake up early you have to take care of animals you have lots of chores that you have to do you have lots of responsibilities to do and then when you get home you have even more things to do you need to do um, you need to do your chores, you need to eat your food, you might have a game that you play with your sports team, and then you have to take care of your animals at home. Make sure that you are practicing good biosecurity so that you break any disease transmission between any animals you were in contact with and your animals at home. That is very critical biosecurity. You need to have a plan in place. You need to make sure you're washing your hands, changing your boots. If you can't change your boots, you wanna scrub them down and go through a boot station. You wanna use those protective plastic booties that cover over your boots just in case you walk through some feces and you don't wanna bring it into your barn. Changing your clothes into new coveralls or a new set of clothing for the barn is great. If you have any tack or equipment that you use at the fair, you wanna make sure that you sterilize that before or you would use it with any of the animals you have at home. Ideally, you would have a set for the fair and you would have a set for home. Make sure that you properly dispose of any waste or any contaminated material so that you don't keep that where the animals are. And by doing that, you are gonna do your best job at making sure that you are not transmitting disease from anywhere you were and not bringing it home to any of your animals. And we're seeing that right now in some of the places where we're having outbreaks. Because if you think about it, we're having outbreaks in other states in a number of commercial operations. And it's not like geese or ducks are flying into those barns because those barns are sealed. Right now, the worry and the concern that I've read about is they're concerned that potentially some of the disease that is coming into the commercial barns and spreading through the barns is actually coming in on the people. So make sure that you are intentional, that wherever you are working with one set of birds, that you do everything you can in your personal biosecurity protocol in order to make sure that you don't bring that disease back to your other birds. And then veterinary care in the biosecurity protocol is critical as well. A healthy bird is going to, um, is going to do a better job at staying healthy and resisting disease. Make sure that you are working with your veterinarian uh, to keep your flock as healthy as it can be. Make sure that you are following all of the great husbandry things that we talk about. You want clean feeders and waterers that you can sterilize. You want to use the correct high plant of nutrition to make sure that your birds are as healthy as they can be. Make sure that they have enough space so that they're not stressed. Make sure that your coop is predator proof so that we don't have any predator stress problems um, causing concern in there. And then one of the things that I love to engage 4-H youth with when I do quality assurance training is you guys are the best stewards of your animals. You spend every day with them at least a little bit. You very commonly know what is normal with your animals because you see them every day. They do things that are normal every day. You know how they're eating, drinking, peeing, and pooping, and walking, and breathing, and, and how their attitude and alertness is. And by knowing those normals, that allows you to quickly determine what is abnormal. And the faster you can determine if something's abnormal and you can do something about it, the greater your chances of a successful outcome.
All right, so I'm going to jump up into the chat right now and I'm going to see if you have any questions for me about direct biosecurity or indirect biosecurity as it pertains to keeping your flock safe. I want you guys to stick that into the chat or the Q&A right now so I can take a look at them. We'll have a chance at the end as well. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into biosecurity for the humans because there's some other diseases that I want everybody here to be aware of so that we make sure that we keep everybody safe. All right. I want to go to a fair with palm trees. I saw that. I know maybe I should grab an Ohio State Fair uh, picture, but when I saw that one, I really, really liked it as well. And so Sarah asked, when should I integrate two groups of week old chicks? Um, Sarah, you're probably, I would probably wait until they get through the brooding period. Um, to make sure that they're doing okay. And that gives you, I, I like to have a 30 day quarantine period. So that's roughly around um, four or a little over four weeks. And so they're gonna be in the brooder about five to six weeks. So that should um, time out pretty good. And then Julie asks, how often should we bleach poultry feeders and waterers? Uh, I guess it would really depend on how many birds you have in terms of how many they get messy. I like people to have a double set of both. And so that they can, um, they can, um, they can clean one and while they're cleaning one, they have another one that they can use. And then I would say at least every week uh, and more if you think it needs more, but I wouldn't wait until you can see anything like visibly dirty because if it's visibly dirty, that's pretty gross. I like to say to 4-Hers that your livestock project animal wants to eat off of a plate and drink out of a water glass that is exactly as clean as the plate you eat off of and the glass you drink out of, but they have no say in the matter. You're the one that determines how clean their plate is and their glass is. So clean them as often as you can because the cleaner that it is, the healthier it is for your animals. Um, thanks, Dee. Hey, Dee, how you doing? I'm doing good. Um, and thanks for bringing a group here. And so is there an LV asks, is there a concern with poultry and swine with this flu? I have not seen any concern with poultry and swine at this flu, um, but both of those two species can, um, uh, can interact with diseases between them. And so uh, we wanna make sure that we're practicing good biosecurity. I will say that some of the avian flus do have uh, tiny chances of interacting with other species, um, but, but what, from what I've read from the CDC, they have not seen big problems with this and they don't consider it a major risk. And if we see different from that, we will let you know right away. And all right, we are getting poetry with, all right, we're starting to get some good questions here. I'll take questions for another minute or so, and then we're going to jump into biosecurity for humans. Is it okay to rate broilers in the same building, but different pens as pullets that will be two months of two months old? So your broilers are only going to be a little bit older than that. Um, I would say that I would try to keep them as separate as you can. Uh, I personally like to separate raising ages, species, chickens away from turkeys and uses um, because they're going to have different nutritional needs. And so um, pullets haven't come into lay yet, so they're not on layer feed. Uh, but, but if they're different ages and they have not been raised in a similar way, uh, you want to keep them separate if at all possible as far as you can, which I know can be difficult. And so you'll want to work with um, work with your 4-H advisor to figure out how you can kind of space your birds out. Uh, as best as you can, knowing that not everybody has as much space as you can. So Sarah asks, how about poultry with goats? Sarah, I have not heard anything about poultry with goats. And then Ivy asks, how far away should we keep our bird feeders for wild birds from our flock? And I would say, Ivy, uh, almost as far as you can, because we want to make sure that we don't have the chickens anywhere near the feces that would come off of wild birds and they tend to defecate all over and around the feeder when they eat, as well as there are a few upper respiratory diseases such as mycoplasmas that can be shed through the air that can affect 
not only wild birds, but can actually be transmitted into backyard flocks. And then in Robinson's, we have three waters. Great. Where should I buy my chicks? Joby, I would work with your 4-H advisor for that. And, and like I said, any number of hatcheries uh, all around Ohio, if they have av availability, I've um, heard that some places have uh, more or less availability, but you would ask the hatchery if they're an NPIP approved hatchery, or if you buy it from a feed store or a, like a tractor supplier, Rural King, ask them uh, and verify where they got their birds as well. And then AZ asks, what are some of the beginning signs of bird flu? And so um, AZ, there's lots of signs that can range from mild, but they can get really bad really fast. They can stop eating and stop drinking and be lethargic, decreased egg production, have upper respiratory signs. And, and unfortunately, they can have acute mortality as well. And then Brianna says, would it be okay if we raise our turkeys with our chickens that we have had for three years? It would be better to separate them. Brianna, that's a great question. I recommend you would separate them. There are some diseases that turkeys carry that affect chickens. There are some diseases chickens carry that affect turkeys. Um, and I would say they're best separate from there. And Brittany asks, is apple cider vinegar a well enough disinfectant? Uh, Brittany, I would recommend something stronger uh, for highly pathogenic avian influenza, like a bleach solution um, or some disinfectant that is rated for viruses. And Sarah asks, meat chicks in with layers, but in separate stalls. I would say uh, as separate as you can get them, I don't want them to interact because keep in mind that they're going to have totally different feeds, right? A meat chicken is going to have a different feed than a layer, which is going to be on um, a layer feed that has a much higher supplement in calcium. Oh, you guys are asking questions faster than I can go. Uh, Lori says, should I wear gloves if I have to hold my chickens? That's not a bad idea. If you can, Lori, if you can't, then make sure that you wash your hands thoroughly and you change and wash the clothing that you were using when you were handling um, your chickens. And then Greg asked, does this disease cause concern for market rabbit litters for fairs? Greg, not that I have seen. I have not seen um, anything that uh, affects uh, market rabbits there. All right. And we have six in the Q&A. Uh, all right. So, Cromer family, if your fact, flock is normally used to free ranging, is the recommendation now to keep them contained until the risk passes? Yes, it actually is. And when will we know the risk has um, be okay to go back to free range? Um, we're hoping to see this start to mitigate when the major parts of migration pass through, which is going to be in May. So, we're hoping in the summer. Okay, which answers Chris's how long do HPI outbreaks usually last? Um, the hope would be that once we get through the, um, the migration that, uh, that we can have that, that start to, to wind down. And then Teresa asked, my son plans on showing chickens this year at the fair. We have a cockatiel at home and concerned with him caring for the chickens, bring it home. Very good question. So I would say that Teresa, that is a perfect example of how you want to practice great biosecurity. Uh, if 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 they do a good job of washing their hands, changing clothes, and all of those things, then they're going to do. Uh, that's as, that's what we're asking them to do. And so, the better job you do with that, the better chance that you're going to have at um, uh, making that in. I'm going to let Liz add, answer Evelyn's with the husbandry, and we have a fall fair. Vela asks, is there a fall migration? Also, um, they will. There will be a migration when birds move from north down to south, and the hope would be that we're not seeing any highly pathogenic influ avian influence at that time. All right, good questions, gang. All right, I am going to go into biosecurity of the humans, and then I will, um, and then if anybody needs to take off, they can, and then I will stay and answer questions for a little bit. Okay, good questions, gang. 4 Hers always bring the goods. Okay. So we talked about highly pathogenic avian influenza, and that is very, very important. And we need everybody to do their absolute very best to maximize our chances for a successful fair season. But I want to talk about some other things because I want to make sure that we understand that biosecurity is not just highly pathogenic avian influenza. It's not just now until summer. It's all the time because any of the animals that we work with, and I'm talking any of them, that can be cattle, that can be your dog or your cat. There is a potential for disease transmission between species. Those are called zoonotic diseases. And there are other diseases that we have to worry about when we're not talking about highly pathogenic avian influenza that could potentially make 
people sick if they're not practicing good biosecurity. So we're going to talk about biosecurity with the humans. And I like to use eggs talking about that when we talk about um, diseases. And I'm going to go up here and I'm going to turn my uh my sound on because i want to make sure you guys can hear what i'm talking about but let's talk about eggs for a minute okay and i i put do not wash in here but i should change that because that's not what i want to say what what i want to talk about with eggs is a layer is going to make about one egg per day and as you guys know it, it comes out of the same opening that the feces comes out with so there is the potential for contamination and i say do not wash um, and opinions vary but but i'm going to strike that out what i mean is this it has to be washed the right way in order to minimize the potential for disease transmission because when a bird comes out of when an egg comes out of a, a hen it comes out at a certain temperature and the gradient of the wash water needs to be matched to that temperature in a certain way because eggs have pores in them so this is a very close-up photograph of an egg and you can see little pores in the shell if the water temperature is not perfectly matched if it's if it's off by a few degrees and and we can share out when we share the recording of this ohio line actually has a fact sheet on how to properly wash eggs to minimize any potential potential chance of disease because if if the temperatures aren't right what happens is you can actually suck the wash water with potential bacteria into the egg which means that even if you've washed the outside of the egg you might have put bacteria inside it and so what I want to do is I want to show a video that is going to demonstrate how eggs are made inside of a bird so you understand the potential risk of disease that can come outside of this that. presentation is brought to you by so Auburn University Department of Poultry Science Liz with funding provided sends them by in the chat that products make sure that, that you guys can hear a gentleman talking that isn't me the US Department of Agriculture we can hear it great thank you In a hen, an ovary and an oviduct make up the reproductive system that creates an egg. The yolk grows in the ovary, and the rest of the egg forms around the yolk as it passes through the oviduct. Most females have two ovaries, but birds are unusual and have only one. A hen's ovary rests against the back body wall, just to the left of the spinal column. The oviduct begins at the ovary, folds back and forth upon itself, and leaves the hen's body through the vent, just below the tail. The ovary and the oviduct occupy a surprisingly small space within the body of the hen, only a few cubic inches. But when the oviduct is stretched out, it's nearly two feet long and has five distinct sections. The infundibulum, the magnum, the isthmus, the shell gland, and the vagina. When a hen is actively laying, nutrients from the food she eats are converted into the building blocks of egg yolk. These building blocks, one-third protein, one-third fat, and one-third water, are then carried by the bloodstream from the liver to the ovary. In the ovary, tiny tissue bags called follicles fill with yolk and grow. The largest follicle on the ovary will release the yolk of the egg the hen will lay tomorrow, while the next largest will produce the next day's yolk, and the next largest will yield the next day's yolk, and so on. In one to two weeks, a follicle grows from less than one millimeter in diameter to the mature size of 25 millimeters. When a yolk matures, the follicle ruptures along a line relatively free from blood vessels, the stigma, and the yolk is released. If any blood vessels cross the stigma, a drop of blood may spot the yolk as it is released from the follicle.
Called the infundibulum, the funnel-shaped upper end of the oviduct envelops the ovary and catches the most mature follicle as it reaches maturation and ovulates. Then the yolk embarks on a 24-hour journey down the oviduct. When the yolk emerges from the follicle and moves into the upper part of the infundibulum, it's the only time in its progress when it is not covered by a layer of albumin. Fertilization, if it is to occur, will take place here. Some bacterial pathogens, such as Salmonella enteritidis, are able to colonize the reproductive tracts of infected hens. If these bacteria become associated with a developing egg as it passes along the tract and before it is surrounded by a shell, they can cause disease in a human consumer of the contaminated yolk or albumin. The yolk spends about 15 minutes in the infundibulum before it passes into the magnum. In the magnum, over a period of about three hours, it will be covered by a dense, shock-absorbing layer of albumin, or egg white. As the albumin forms around the yolk, spiral ridges which run the length of the magnum cause the yolk to spin like a bullet in a rifle barrel. This spinning twists the protein fibers in the albumin just in front of and just behind the yolk and makes two pigtail-like structures called the chalaza. The chalaza keep the yolk suspended in the center of the albumin and ultimately prevent it from moving around inside the egg. The magnum gives way to the next section of the oviduct, the isthmus. Here, the shell membranes are deposited. These thin layers of protein wrap loosely around the albumin covering the yolk. It is as though the yolk and its layer of albumin are a blob of jello wrapped with two sheets of cellophane. The process does not result in a smooth egg-shaped structure. In fact, an egg leaving the isthmus probably looks more like a prune than a plum. The partially formed egg then enters the shell gland. Here, over the next 20 hours, the shell will form. First, a thin albumin is secreted. This thin albumin is mostly water and it moves by osmosis through the two shell membranes into the highly concentrated thick albumin surrounding the yolk. This plumps the egg into a normal shape and stretches the shell membranes tight around it. Next, a highly concentrated solution of calcium carbonate is secreted by the shell gland and crystals of calcite form and grow on the outer shell membrane. As the crystals expand, they grow into one another to form a solid shell. Very tiny spaces left in between the crystals leave pores in the shell. Lastly, a special protein solution, called the cuticle, is deposited onto the eggshell. Gas can pass through the proteinaceous cuticle and through the pores in the shell, but the two layers protect the egg from harmful bacteria. Finally, in a process called oviposition, the egg flips end over end. This occurs through contractions of the uterus, synchronized with relaxation of the muscular vagina, and pushes the egg out of the hen's body. An important part of the egg 
does not form until after it is laid. When an egg is laid, it fills the shell. However, a hen's body temperature is 106 degrees Fahrenheit, and eggs are generally laid into environments that are 20 to 40 degrees cooler. As the egg cools, the inner portion contracts and forms an air cell between the two shell membranes. A chick would puncture and breathe through the air in this cell before hatching. The fully formed egg now begins another journey. All right, so I showed that video one because I think it's a super cool video, but two, if you noticed that there is a type of salmonella that can potentially be carried inside of an egg, that is a salmonella that won't make a chicken sick, but it would make a person sick. And so what I want to stress with that is when we talk about biosecurity, right now we're using heightened biosecurity to do our best job in order to protect our backyard flocks, to make sure that we're safeguarding the rest of the birds in Ohio, to increase our chances of having a successful fair. But what I want to make sure that we keep in mind is we do biosecurity best when we do it all the time. When we are doing direct biosecurity to prevent interactions with wild birds in our flock, and when we're doing indirect biosecurity, make sure that we don't have disease transmitted from us into birds, but also from birds into us. Because there are a number of cases where people can get salmonella from handling their birds and not doing a good job with washing their hands or practicing good biosecurity. In fact, this is actually a scientific study that was in a number of different journals. In fact, the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association. And they found that a bunch of people, 49% were snuggling baby birds, 13% were kissing baby birds, and then people were keeping birds in their living room or their kitchen or their bedroom or their bathroom, even though the majority of people are aware that there is a potential for disease from, from animals into people, and we want to make sure that we are aware that, that that occurs so that we can practice our best sanitation and biosecurity so that doesn't happen to us. OK, because there's lots of those cases and we don't want to have any more of those. We're going to continue with our biosecurity all along. So whatever you do, don't kiss your chicken, OK, because she doesn't want to get kissed. Trust me when I tell you, that's not the look of a chicken that wants to get kissed. All right. So. I am going to start jumping into the chat question and the Q&A questions. If you have some questions for me about biosecurity, feel free to put those in there so we can get those answered. All right. Oh, we got a lot of them that were saying we can hear it. Great. If you would like to watch that video again, that video is called The Virtual Chicken, and it was made by Auburn University, and you can find it on YouTube. Okay. Let's go back and see where we are at. Okay, does this uh, disease affect chicks potentially? Um, yes, it can. Vela asks, will this recording be shared somewhere? Yep, me and Liz will make sure that we get this recorded, hosted up on YouTube so that anybody who could not attend will be able to attend. And in my own flock, if I want to do skinny hens, do they need to be kept apart for a period of time before they can be put together? So Joby, a quarantine ideally would be 30 days. And ideally you would have a, herd, uh, a health check by a veterinarian. Um, I'm not a huge fan of mixing species together. So if you were introducing guineas to an established um, a flock of guineas, a 30 day quarantine and then a very careful observation period for signs of disease. I wouldn't recommend keeping guinea hens with say your layers because you're going to have different nutritional needs between them and you want to make sure that uh, you are feeding them according to their intended use. Um, how specifically do you recommend to disinfect waterers with? So what I like to do with um, waterers or feeders is if they have any sort of organic matter on them, dried feed or any kind of residue on there, scrub them with like a dish detergent just to get the organic matter off. And then a 5% bleach solution um, is what I would recommend for the ratio. And then Levi asks, when you have broilers that are sick, can you send the rest away to a different pen? Yes. So I recommend very commonly, I get a lot of people that contact me and they have a bird that's acting weird. It might be limping. It might have some kind of swelling. It might have any number of problems. The first thing that I do is recommend that they would separate that bird into a separate pen 
to have a quarantine so that they can observe that bird um, for any changes. Move it away from the other birds in case there's any kind of contagiousness, and that allows you to not only monitor it, but contact the vet so that you can have them come in and find, uh, they can take a look at it right away. And I want to thank Liz um, for getting this organized and getting this going right away. Um, it's uh, There's been a lot of people that have doing a lot of great work uh, sharing the information out and, and doing their best job and um, a partnership between my Ag and Natural Resources Program and 4-H. We're going to do everything we can to make sure um, that we get the word out and, 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 and do our best to make sure we got a successful fair season this year.